Lisa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So we did a fun Instagram live a few weeks ago, all about glute strength for runners. So here we are again, expanding on that conversation for the podcast. So I just appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So let's start with some basic stuff. I I just want to make sure we're, we're all understanding exactly what we're going to talk about today. We're talking about the glutes. The glute is not really a muscle. It's a muscle group. As far as I understand it, what muscles are included in, you know, the term glutes when we say that? Yeah, for sure. So you have the gluteus minimus. We'll start with the little one. And then you have the gluteus medius and gluteus maximus. I feel like Gluteus medius is a very common um, muscle. I feel like a lot of runners know clamshells and sidesteps for gluteus medius. And of course, the gluteus maximus, the big beefy muscle that sits on your backside. Very important muscle for runners. What do these muscles do? Like, is one more important to think about for runners? Like, I noticed that you, you immediately went to the glute med to talk about you didn't really talk about the gluteus minimus. Like, how should runners think about, you know, what these muscles do? Should you think about them individually, or is that just getting lost in the weeds? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say you can think about them individually, but they also work as a group. So gluteus medius, I feel like I jumped right to it because it gets so much attention on socials and on you know, the internet just always getting the blame. It always, you know, people always blame that muscle for knee pain or hip pain or even foot pain. I feel like they are very important muscles and sometimes they're not worked correctly or maybe there are faulty movement patterns that cause them to not work correctly even if you think they're strengthening, you're strengthening them. So I would think about them individually because they do different actions at the hip. So I would think about them individually. Okay. So what do they do at the hip? You know, I I understand some of them are, you know, they're all located in slightly different places. And so the, when they contract, they'll be doing slightly different things in, in the way of moving the femur. Like, is there a specific task that each one of these glute muscles accomplishes? Yeah, for sure. So the gluteus minimus and medius, more of the stability muscles of the hip. I like to think of like a single leg position, making sure your hip's not dropping. So having that hip stability. Gluteus medius also does internal rotation as well as external rotation, depending on the different muscle fibers. Um, So the anterior part does internal rotation, the posterior part does external rotation. And then the glute max does external rotation with hip extension. So a couple different lines of pull depending on what motion you're doing and what activity you're doing. I tend to think this is, you know, this is arguably one of the most important muscle groups for runners because if you have some type of dysfunction in one of these muscles or or more than one, it affects how your leg moves from the initial lever point. And if you're having a problem with that initial movement pattern right from the beginning, it's going to be really hard to correct that further down the chain. So I'm just very aware of this as, as, a, as a crucial muscle group for runners, because if we do have that dysfunction, you know, we're probably going to be at a much higher risk of injury and we're probably not going to be able to perform as well, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's funny you say movement patterns because that's the biggest reason, I guess, I would say that I see that the glute max isn't firing correctly or it's not as strong as it should be because it all comes down to those movement patterns. We know that strength training is very important, but you have to have some sort of goal behind your strength training. You can't just be going through the motions. You really have to be focusing on quality of movement, making sure you're getting those movement patterns down. And that's going to make a big difference in your running. Yeah, for sure. And you said something earlier that that sort of like is going to give me nightmares as a running coach later on. So first, let me just say thanks, Lisa. (laughs) Um, You were saying that like you can either go, you can go through strengthening exercises for the glutes, but you may not actually be working them the proper way. So that means that there's all these well-intentioned runners, maybe even myself, who are doing the right exercises, but not getting the value from them. That to me is such a terrifying concept. 
So can, can you talk a little bit to that and, and what you mean by that? Yeah, for sure, because I know I've been there and done that. So let's take a clamshell, for example. Most people know what a clamshell is. You're in a sideline position. Your knees are bent and your feet are together, and you just lift that top knee up and down. You can use a resistance band around your knees, and that's supposed to be you know, the gold, I guess, exercise for gluteus medius. And the problem with that is there's a really big compensation where your TFL, which is – sits more on the anterior part of your hip or the front part of your hip can turn on and kind of take over in that while you open and close your knees. So it kind of depends on where your pelvic position is. Like if you lift your knee up and you rotate your pelvis backwards, your TFL is just going to be taking over. Of course, your glute meat is going to be firing a little bit, but just that movement pattern is just going to be teaching that TFL just, just keep staying overactive and keep activating. This is probably a good segue into my next question, which was essentially like, what's the difference between glute strength and glute activation? Mm -hmm. and, and I know we talked a little bit about this on our IG Live, because it's interesting to me that the glutes are one of the few muscles where we actually talk about activation. You know, everyone's like, I got to activate my glutes before I go running. Nobody says I need to activate my quadriceps before I go running. That would just be sort of a hilarious thing to say, you know, before the group run. But, you know, is this aspect of activating the muscle sort of what you're talking about here? Like, yes, you could be strong, but you're not even using the muscles that you need to be using. Yeah, exactly. I mean, think about like a deadlift. You could be you could be compensating with your low back or your adductors and your hamstring could be taking over, but you think you're working your glutes. So it's definitely possible that you could think that you're strengthening your glutes, but they're not turning on to the full degree that they could. So when it comes to muscle act activation, it really comes down to, can your brain tell your muscle to turn on when you want it to? And that's a very big difference between having that strength. I hear all the time that runners can deadlift, you know, hundreds of pounds, but maybe they can't do a single leg hip thrust without lumbar spine compensation, which is big. That would definitely be an exercise where glutes are activating. You can make it a strength exercise, adding a dumbbell, but just having that glute activation where it's just isolated glute stability, basically, to lift your pelvis up, that can make a huge difference in your running if you can figure that out and get that going. I guess the million dollar question is like, how do you figure this out? Like if you're someone who maybe thinks of themselves as fairly strong, or even if you know you have this problem, like I, I don't do strength exercises. I feel funny and uncoordinated when I do do them. I'm probably not doing them correctly. What's the solution? All right. The million dollar answer is, no, I'm just kidding. It really comes down to just addressing your movement patterns. It's not, it's no big secret. I think it really comes down to maybe you have to just drop the weight and then revisit those movement patterns, specifically like the hip hinge. Um, it really is that simple, <laughs> believe it or not, but just re <laughs> revisit that hip hinge, making sure that you can stick your butt back with a hip hinge. Um, a hip hinge is like a deadlift, like a good, you could do a good morning as a hip hinge. Um, a hip thrust with your mid back against like a block as you lift your pelvis up, that's a hip hinge. Um, so just revisiting that hip hinge. I wouldn't say go straight to like bridges because you can really compensate with lumbar spine with bridges. So just revisit those movement patterns, forget about the weight and just focus on quality of movement. I think a really practical uh, strategy for addressing this problem, if, if a runner did have it, is let's actually go to either a strength coach or a physical therapist who understands these movements and how to do them properly for like a one to three session package. I, I'm a big fan of this. Like at the very beginning of, say, say you're a fitness journey or, or say, okay, I'm going to embark upon this season. I'm going to try to run a fast marathon or half marathon, but I want to make sure I'm doing all my strength right. Let me just go see a PT and, and run through like these 12 exercises to make sure I really understand them. And, and maybe you can get yourself filmed or something like that. Mm -hmm. That to me is like a wonderful one-time investment that would really be helpful at 
educating the runner on not only like the proper movement, but also what your personal limitations might be when you go about that movement. Yeah, for sure. I wish someone from the insurance side was listening so we could do that, you know, in a typical outpatient clinic. But unfortunately, with insurance, you know, you go to an orthopedic clinic as a physical therapist and you really are expecting that that patient to be injured. It's it's just not happening with insurance right now, and I think that's why cash-based cash based clinics are really popping up. But another alternative could be that you get you have a running analysis, and with a running analysis, maybe you also have like a movement assessment as well, so you can kind of get the best of both worlds and really focus on like the preventative side before you start training for a big race. Yeah, that's a really good idea too. Um, I, I used to be a little bit more interested in, in certain movement screens. Um, you know, not necessarily let's go through these specific strength exercises that you're going to be doing in your training and, and see if you can do them properly, but more like, let's just see how you move globally, like all over the place, upper body, lower body, all planes of motion. Do you think there's value in those kinds of movement screens for just pointing out any potential red flags or, or big areas of improvement for runners? And, and are there any that you recommend? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, that's how I treat my runners, my one-on-one -on -one clients. I think the whole goal, though, if you're going to do one is or go through one, is that it should be pretty much a whole body assessment. Like if you came to me with knee pain and I only looked at your squat and I only looked at your single leg squat, that's, that's just not enough. Like you would want a whole body assessment, thoracic spine rotation, how your lumbar spine is moving, how your big toe stability is, your ankle mobility, maybe even like your shoulder external rotation. So then you can look at arm swing, like the whole, the whole picture. You definitely want the whole picture as a runner, not just focusing on one thing. Maybe you've had a history of injuries in your knee. You don't want to just focus on just the knee because running is a whole body movement. So you really want to look at how everything is connected. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up because like you said, running is a, a whole body complex movement. I've, I've started to really appreciate the complexities of running form as I, you know, continue my own coaching and, and running career. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting. I sort of like chafe a little bit at, at folks who, who only want to focus on an individual muscle or, you know, my hip hurts. What's wrong with my hip? It's like, well, it might actually not be your hip. It could be mm -hmm. something totally unrelated that's causing a, an unfavorable movement pattern that we have to address. So I think thinking more globally about form and also about injuries, too, is a really productive mindset uh, for runners to have. Um, yeah. Lisa, I'd love to ask you a little more about sort of like mistakes that runners make when they go about either strengthening their glutes or trying to activate their glutes. Do you see any common, um, you know, mistakes that runners make with either ignoring this muscle group or, or otherwise mistreating it? Yes. I am so happy you asked that because it's a big yes there. So let's start with, um, the hamstrings. So if you're laying on your stomach and just on the ground, you're laying on your stomach and I just tell you to squeeze your glutes, you know, turn on your glutes, squeeze your glutes. One of the big compensations that I see if someone is having any sort of like hip pain, hamstring pain, even, even like a hip impingement in the front of their hip is their hamstring will turn on before their glutes turn on, which is not very ideal. You really want your glutes to turn on right before your hamstring turns on. If your hamstring, hamstrings turn on before glutes, hamstrings are just going to overpower glutes. So that's one of the big things that I see is hamstrings kind of like overtake the glutes. It's a pretty big um, compensation that I see, especially with someone who has like a proximal hamstring tendinopathy, where it's not really the case that their hamstring's weak. It's just that it's overpowering and it's pretty much being overworked. So it's in this cycle of inflammation and the tendon just continuing to be weak. So that's one of the big things that I see is definitely hamstrings taking over from glutes. Now, I used to have this high hamstring pain. And when you said proximal hamstring pain, uh, to, to translate that for our non-PT listeners, 
Is this a uh, hamstring pain that is closer to your butt as opposed to closer to your knee? Yes, correct. So think about hamstring pain that comes on, on your, near your sit bones, basically. Like if you're sitting for long periods of time, it's like that upper hamstring pain. Maybe it comes on after a mile or so into a run, not necessarily right in the beginning of a run. Yeah, and you know, this, this side of, sort of pain is also really interesting because like you said, it's almost never the fault of the hamstrings. It's almost always a glute issue from my experience, you know, coaching runners, having runners go to PTs, reporting back to me, talking to physical therapists like yourself. So I think that's a really good takeaway for anybody experiencing that kind of high hamstring tendinopathy or, or otherwise high hamstring pain. It's probably an issue with the glutes. Um, and I thought it was really interesting how you were talking about, you know, if the hamstring is activated before the glutes, you're, you're probably going to have this issue where the hamstrings are overpowering the glutes. And, and this really gets back to the whole idea of there is this kinetic chain of how muscles need to, to work in concert with each other. And, you know, you shouldn't be like activating your little toe muscle before you activate your quads. You know, there's the proper order of things. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this really speaks to that. Should we sort of be going proximal to distal, like hip, glute, down to the hamstrings, quads, then the calves? Like there's an order of, of using these muscles through the running stride. Is that right? Yeah, that is correct. It really comes down to the timing of when a muscle is turning on when you're running. So there are studies that say you should have a top-down approach. There are studies you should say you have a bottom-up approach. I kind of take both, I guess, and look at the whole picture, and it really does depend on the injury. It does depend on maybe their running form or their movement pattern. So that's where you kind of want to take a lot of things into consideration versus only blaming, like, big toe and ankle for a hip injury, you still want to look at the hip. You still want to look at how it's moving in lumbar spine. So I kind of take both approaches there. I think it, it depends, unfortunately, but it's not a bad idea to look at both and see what's going on. Okay. So if we are kind of looking at the order of muscle activation, because that can be a red flag if you're activating your hamstrings before your glutes, are there any other red flags that you might see in a runner's program? You know, like I think obviously, you know, one that I would look for as a coach is no strength training whatsoever. And that obviously is not something that I would recommend. Besides the obvious, you're not doing anything for your glutes. What other kind of mistakes are runners making when it comes to strength training for their glutes or activating their glutes? I would say another big one I see is lumbar spine um, comp lumbar spine compensation. So low back compensation, maybe they are, have a lot of mobility and they're hypermobile in their lumbar spine. So I'm going to back it up a little bit. So if your glute is not activating as much as it should, or it's not as strong as it should, chances are you also don't have that full hip extension coming from the hip joint, or maybe the hip flexor is tight. So you don't have that full hip extension. So that's when I usually see lumbar spine is hypermobile. So it has a lot of movement. It's making up for a tight hip because the body's going to compensate and get that movement somewhere else since the hip is too tight. So lumbar spine is hypermobile. It's moving too much and it usually hyperextends to get that hip, which what looks like into more hip extension, but really it's just coming from the lumbar spine. So that's another really big compensation that I see. I see it in deadlifts as well, going back to that hip hinge. So lumbar spine usually has too much mobility and needs more stability. So it really needs to work on stabilizing in a range of motion. You know, even though we're talking about dysfunctions, I can't help but just be in awe of the human body because even when we have a an enormous muscle group like the glute complex that's not working properly, we're still going to be able to get a job done. I mean, we might be recruiting the hamstring or the lower back in a way that's not ideal, but it is still pretty amazing to see that the body will get the job done no matter what. Yeah, it's so cool. It's also frustrating at times, but it's really cool at other times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure as a PT, you're like, yeah, it's pretty great, but, but stop. Stop doing all this dysfunctional <laughs> compensations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Lisa, let's talk about some actionable strategies for 
for addressing these problems. We've talked a lot about problems. We've talked about compensations. Uh, I would love to define, sort of divide this part of the conversation into what we can do with strength training, what we can do with our run training specifically, and then what we can do with what I'll call lifestyle. You know, the other 23 hours of the day, typically where we're not training. So let's start with strength training. Do you recommend a, a certain approach, certain exercises, certain frequency to, to glute specific exercises? How do you even begin to approach this? Yeah, it can definitely feel overwhelming trying to do all the things. So what I like to say with glutes, there's a stability part to glutes, there's a strength part to glutes, and there's a power part to glutes. So you want to address all those three different parts. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. That can all be done in one workout. But I always like to say with the stability part, maybe it's focusing on a single leg exercise, like tapping your heel off a step, having that control as you go through a range of motion. Then once you go into more of the strength part, maybe you're doing deadlifts, maybe you're doing a hip thrust or even like a goblet squat, a step up, something like that where you're loading the muscle with resistance. You're having, you're including a dumbbell with this. Um, and then the last part, the power part, you want to focus on those fast twitch muscle fibers. So maybe now you're doing jump squats, you're doing quick hip thrusts, you're doing kettlebell swings, something where you're loading the muscle, but it's going through a quick range of motion, focusing on that power. I think if you focus on all three of those, you're really going, you, you can't miss. <laughs> you're going to be covering it all. Yeah, that's great. And, and I like how you so succinctly divided this into stability, strength, and power. Mm -hmm. And if we could just define those real quick. So stability would be your a little bit more isometric strength, your ability to hold a body position against forces moving in other directions. W would you say that that's your definition or, or close to it? Yeah, very close. I would start with an isometric. And then it's also controlling your body through a range of motion. I think control is the big word when it comes to stability. So those stability muscles are around a joint because especially with the hip, it has a ton of range of motion, just like the shoulder. So with that range of motion, you want to have a lot of control. I'm going to back up a little bit. I also forgot to include mobility. I already said that you need hip, ex you need enough hip extension. So enough mobility of the hip to go into hip extension in order to have enough glute or in order to activate your glutes appropriately and have that glute strength. So mobility is the joints range of motion and then stability is controlling a movement through that range of motion. I love it. Okay. Um, it, it was interesting. I was actually doing some step ups yesterday and, and I was not doing them for strength. I was trying to do them fairly slowly to work on stability and control. Like, I love how you're like, this is the word you need to focus on is control. Mm -hmm. Because with those kinds of single leg exercises, you can sort of cheat your way through them if you're using momentum and you're doing them very quickly. Whereas, you know, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I just like to do them really slow to make sure that I have that level of control, even if, you know, I'm fatigued after a run or I did a workout the, the prior day, so my legs are a little bit tired. I think having that amount of control can be really important. Um, it, it's also interesting because as a coach, I love to use this as a, a bit of a diagnostic tool. So if a runner is like feeling kind of fatigued, they've got a big workout in front of them, do a couple of these sorts of single leg stability exercises. And if you are substantially more wobbly and you can't control yourself, you're probably experiencing a fair amount of neuromuscular fatigue and maybe a big workout isn't a good idea. So a little, little tangent of mine. Um, yeah. I'm let's talk a little bit more about the power. Go ahead. Oh, go for it. I was just going to rant um, and add on with... I love when rants. You do, when you do stability, only because I see this all the time, I'm sure you do too. When you do stability exercises like a step up, you can, you can cheat 100%. Your shoulders can lean to one side, your pelvis can dip. So that's where I'm coming back to that quality of movement, retraining your body, focus, slow down, focus on that control. If you have to put your hands on your hips to make sure you know one side doesn't dip, making sure shoulders stay stacked on top of hips, I think that's a perfect thing to start with if you really wanna focus on stability.
Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and I think earlier in my running career, like I almost exclusively focused on stability. Then I added in a bunch of mobility. And, and I think just those two forms of exercise, you know, if you're doing strength training with those goals in mind, will take you pretty far. You know, even if you're, you don't have a high amount of absolute strength, you know, the, in other words, the amount of weight you can lift, even if that's not super high, but you have a lot of control, you have good mobility from an injury perspective, you're probably going to have a bet, a better, uh, injury tolerance than someone who doesn't have the kind of control and stability, even if they might be stronger than you. A thousand percent. I mean, Let's talk a little bit more about, yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, I keep interrupting you, but I want to hear what you have to say. Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> it's okay. I was just going to say, think about what we do in rehab. If someone comes in an injured runner, I'm not like lift more weights, you know, like load it up. I'm more like, let's work on your control. Let's work on your motion. If there's any sort of stiffness or joint limitation, it's never, con it's never, let's just lift more weight. Let's just lift more weight. It's always coming back to that control. Can we order these, what I'll call physical skills in terms of what you might work with a runner on first, you know, like, so obviously power is probably not something you're going to saddle a runner with first. You're probably going to work on something either like maybe stability or mobility, but how do you think about sort of what you would work on first with either a beginner or an injured runner? And then how would you order these different goals? Yeah. So let's think about like a house. So the foundation of the house is mobility and stability. Now, this is going to be different for everyone. It's really going to just depend on if you're hypermobile, maybe you have too much motion, so you don't necessarily have to work on mobility and you have to work on more control. But most of the time, it's mobility and stability. Focus on improving that range of motion, focus on controlling your body through that range of motion. Then it's into strength. Now you're strength training, you're able to build and work on your hypertrophy. And then the roof of the house is power, plyometrics, working on speed. I like that. I like that. I like the house analogy too. That's probably something coaches use a lot when talking about running fitness. And, and uh, I like how PTs use it as well to talk about the structural capabilities of athletes. And when we are building power, you know, I, I can think of this from a lot of different perspectives. You know, we could get a strength coach in here and he'll talk about power a little bit differently than a running coach. You know, obviously as runners, when I think about power, I think about speed. I think about running very fast, you know, the, the final 400 meters of a race, you know, anyone who can run that really fast is capable of a, of a high amount of force output. Um, what kind of things do you like to implement in a runner's program to work on power? Yeah, that's a good question. So like I said before, though, I'm not working on power unless they have that control. They have the mobility, stability, they're building strength. That's when we're working on power. It's like icing on the cake. So that's how I like to think of it. So if we're working on power, we're usually working on, I like to like subgroup it. So you have the plyometrics part and then you have more of the power exercises. So I listed a couple power exercises before where it's like the kettlebell swings where you have more of that heavy weight and then low reps. You're working on not really like controlling that weight through a range of motion. You're working on the speed that you can move that weight. So kettlebell swings, um, let's see, jump squats with weights, hip thrusts with a dumbbell on your pelvis. And then, so those are more like the power exercises that you're doing throughout your workout. And then you have more of the plyometrics. So that's double leg jumping in place, single leg jumping in place, different variety of movements, lateral jumps, box jumps, that sort of thing. Do marathoners have to do this kind of work? Because I know we've got a bunch of marathoners listening to this, thinking to themselves, well, I certainly don't need to be doing plyometrics and, and box jumps and mm -hmm. kettlebell swings and, and all these things that, you know, sort of remind me of, you know, a CrossFit workout or something along those lines. Is this necessary for the real endurance folks, the the marathoners, the ultra runners, maybe even half marathoners? I think it is. I think if you want to improve your running performance, you want to even improve, not necessarily like your sprint speed, but I mean, it would help with that, but also just how long you can run at a certain pace. If you want to improve your running form, 
your efficiency, your running economy. I mean, could keep going on. But I think then you should do plyometrics. If you said yes to any of those, you should do plyometrics and work on your power. Okay, I'm sold. That, that was an easy sell, Lisa. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so, okay, I'm glad we've got a very sort of methodical approach to our strength training that's going to include a lot of different aspects of strength. It's not just let's get in the gym and see how much weight we can pull off the ground. Let's move over a little bit to our run training. Can runners prioritize glute strength while they're running, you know, with certain workouts, with certain drills, with other types of running that they might implement in their training program? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it really all starts with the dynamic warm up, warming your hips up. If your hips aren't warmed up, maybe you are used to just going out there. I know I definitely used to do this, but maybe you're just used to going out there and then you feel warmed up at mile like three or four versus working on that dynamic warm up, opening up those hips and into each rotation and into extension. I think that's the first place that you start. You can definitely do running drills that will focus on glute power. Think like power skips even that's focusing on glute power. And then you can work on your glute activation while you're running. I use this drill for runners who may be fatigued with their running form. Maybe like they can go a mile with glute extension and hip extension and they're using their glutes and then their running form may become sloppy. That's where I pull out a drill. It's basically you're standing with one foot in front of the other, like a kickstand position. Your resistance band is around your knees and you're just working on the back leg, going into more hip extension and just firing the glutes. So it kind of depends. That's not necessarily the case for everyone, but you can work on glute strength and glute activation and glute power during different parts of your running. And then, of course, if you're picking up your speed, you're working on your glutes even more. Working on hills, you're working your glutes even more. So don't forget that as well. I'll share a little bit of an anecdotal story here. You know, I, I ran in high school and college, and then in the years post-collegiately, I was still training really hard and running competitively. And, you know, I'm pushing 40 at this point, and uh, I, I'm just not training at the same level that I was. And one of the first things to go was the intensity of my running. You know, even if I was still running a lot, I just wasn't doing the same crazy workouts that I used to be doing. And I did notice that with a drop in my ability to run really fast, there was this like reduction in just feeling really smooth, you know, because running easy when you're capable of running very, very fast is actually quite easy, you know, and it's, it's almost like weird, like an easy run is easy, but mm -hmm. for a lot of runners, an easy run isn't always easy because they feel uncoordinated their stride doesn't feel good. You know, they get they get fatigued, their form even starts to fall apart. And so it's a very visceral reminder that strength and power and being able to run very fast, it makes all the other aspects of your training just feel a lot easier too. So even if you're not, you know, someone who wants to run a fast mile or something like that, mm -hmm. just working on your speed has all these other benefits that will bleed into the rest of your training that I think is, is really, uh, really helpful to think about. Uh, Lisa, what do you think about hill workouts? Are those, are those effective types of workouts that are going to almost have a little bit of a strengthening effect as well? Yeah, I, I'm giggling because there's just no hills around me. And if there is a hill, it's like minimal and it just feels exhausting. But, <laughs> but then I go and go to Pittsburgh and visit my grandma and the hills are insane. So I definitely feel you if you have hills around you. But yeah, I mean, you're working more on the power. I mean, especially if it's like a short, quick hill where you're pretty much sprinting up that hill or going pretty fast up that hill, you're working more on the power output of that glute versus if it's a gradual long hill, maybe you're slowing your pace down. That's more of the endurance aspect of that muscle group. So it kind of depends on the incline, kind of depends on your speed as well. But we should definitely be doing more hill work. I think hills are like great. They'll make you faster. They'll improve your endurance as well. Right now it's just me in the tread doing the hills. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you somewhere in Pennsylvania? I'm in I'm in Richmond, Virginia, so it's pretty it's pretty flat. <laughs> it's pretty darn flat. Oh, okay. <laughs> but if I go up Yeah, to you got to go to other parts of Virginia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I'm, yeah, I'm close to the mountain. I've always thought so. hills were. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, the, the mountains, we got to get you out here to Colorado and, and really introduce you to some hills. We have a couple hills out here. <laughs> I'm going September, actually. Are you? Are you going to be in the, the Denver Boulder area? I will be flying into Denver and then Rocky Mountain National Park. So out there, out in that area. Never been, so I'm excited. I hope you love it. September in Colorado is, I think, one of the best months. I think May and May, June, and September are probably the ideal months to be in, in the Denver area. So I hope you have a great time. Um, let's talk a little bit more. Actually, I have a quick follow-up question for you. You mentioned that drill that you like to use as um, in a, either an assessment or a strengthening tool where you're standing with your legs one in front of the, uh, the other like a kickstand. Do you happen to have a video of that? Because I would love to include it in the show notes for this podcast. Yeah, I can record a video of it. I'll figure out. Okay, cool. It. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you already had it on your Instagram account because your Instagram, by the way, is a treasure trove of amazing content for runners. Let's just pause, go over to Lisa's Instagram account, subscribe, and you'll probably never get injured again. Yeah, it's a, it definitely has a lot, a lot, lot of exercises on there. It can be a little overwhelming. So if you need anything, just message me. But I'm sure I have that exercise somewhere on my Instagram. So I will send that over to you. Yeah, yeah. Do we have to do all of those exercises? Like every, we have to do like 200 exercises a day or it doesn't have to be that complicated? No, it doesn't have to be that complicated. That's, it's really more about, <laughs> thank goodness it doesn't, right? Um, that's really more about quality of movement versus just going through the motion, trying to knock out, you know, maybe 15 exercises from my account versus really slowing it down, making sure you're getting the form right and maybe just doing 20 reps of it. I think that's going to take you a lot further than just rushing through exercises just to check it off your list. Yeah. Don't rush through any exercise. I think being intentional is, is a really good point. Um, let's talk about the final pillar of this tripod that we've sort of been talking about here. We talked about strength training. We talked about your run training. Finally, there's your lifestyle. What's, what, el what else is going on in your life? Um, and, and I think we can also talk about this from the perspective of what are some things that you might be doing that could be hurting your glute strength or activation abilities and then some things that you might be able to do during your, your life, you know, the other 23 hours of the day that might be helpful for either strengthening or activating your glutes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with one. Well, I know, you know, posture is a big topic. So there's, there's really, I love that research is going to this, but there's no such thing as perfect posture. It's more so just change your posture up every couple hours so you're not just in one position for the entire day so i think that's really important to note the other thing is your glutes aren't weak because you sit on them all day they're weak because they're weak i know that's a big one um so making sure that you are still strength training you're still doing all those things outside of you know sitting and working and running um and then another thing that i was thinking of is also pelvic floor connection. That's a really big one. If your glutes are weak, your core and your pelvic floor are going to be compensating with that. And that had me thinking about, I know, you know, I feel like sometimes runners have like a strong side and a weak side. And I know for me, left side's weak side. So I always sit with, or I'm trying not to, but I usually sit with my hip into this external rotation position, almost like a figure four position because it's just more comfortable. So make sure you're paying attention to what your legs are doing. Try not to you know, cross your legs for a long period of time. Maybe note any positions that you always go into and really try to avoid that. You know, it is so funny that you just said that because my left side is also my weak side. And I feel like I sit with my left leg internally rotated, sort of pointed in when I'm not paying attention, it's sort of like my go-to posture that I like to have when I'm sitting down. And, and now that I'm trying to be more mindful about my body positions, I've realized I, I just can't be doing this anymore because I get up and it's almost like I've been reinforcing this 
poor mobility, this poor movement habit of mine. And I shouldn't be doing that when I'm sitting down, right? I should be sitting in a more neutral position or at least moving through a wider range of motion. So mm -hmm. I think being mindful of the positions that you put yourself in throughout the day, I think is really important. Um, and, and it's funny you mentioned how variety of positions is so critical because I was just at this weekend workshop with like 30 plus physical therapists. I was the only running coach there. It was kind of funny, Good but, uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> yeah, I was a fish out of water a little bit, but I learned a lot and a, a big part of, you know, this one presentation that they had was exactly that it's you know there is no perfect posture the your perfect posture is your next position and the whole lesson was variety and and moving through a variety of positions throughout the day you know just don't don't sit in the same position all day long and um you know one thing that i did to address this a long time ago was i got a standing desk not because i think standing is better than sitting it's because i can just do both mm -hmm. and the chair i have is kind of this weird stool that doesn't have a back to it. It rocks back and forth, it rotates. So I'm constantly sort of all over the place and, and I really need to like keep my body in a good position myself without sinking back into this, you know, plush, lazy boy sort of armchair. And, and I think for me personally, that's, that's had a good effect on at least my mindfulness of my body positions throughout the day. Yeah, for sure. That reminded me of even sleep positions. Going back to my leg or my hip always being into this external rotation, I sleep like on my stomach and my left hip is always out to the side, basically into extreme hip external rotation. Um, so it's not necessarily a good thing to always be in that one position, um, which is pretty interesting. I'm going to go down this rabbit hole if I can because I think I could help someone out that might be struggling with glute strength or glute activation or hip pain and the big thing with my journey of my hip and my glute weakness I guess you could say is not necessarily it doesn't come down to just well strengthen your glutes strengthen your glutes it really comes down to addressing range of motion first so I have a ton of hip external rotation not a ton of hip internal rotation so when I strengthen my glutes, I can't strengthen them through that full range of motion because your glute max also does external rotation. So it's really interesting. You definitely want to also, if you're tr really trying to activate your glutes, strengthen your glutes, make sure if that hip is tight into internal rotation, you also address that as well. So you can now strengthen it full through a full range of motion to get the most benefit out of your strength exercises. Is there any way to know if you're doing a particular exercise and you're not going through the full range of motion? Because I think that's a big blind spot that runners have and, and especially runners who, you know, like me and you have, you know, a certain issue with one side and we've gotten so used to using one side a little bit differently than the other that it may feel normal, quote unquote, normal to us, but mm -hmm. normal doesn't necessarily mean optimal or um, or, or balanced between each side. So is there any way to sort of figure this out besides going to see a, a PT like you? I would say the easiest way is take your shoes off, take your socks off, try doing a squat in front of a mirror and just see what you look like doing that squat. Pay attention from left side to right side. So this is going to take a lot of body self-awareness and then go into a single leg squat, left side and right side with just your hands on your hips. You're going to be able to note looking at yourself, especially if you really feel like one side is weaker or tighter and one side's really strong. You're going to be able to note if they feel different. Do a couple reps, take note of it, look at yourself straight on, and then look at yourself from the side. I feel like that's going to give you a lot of insight into what's going on. Pay attention to your pelvic position. If one side is dipping, pay attention to your balance, pay attention to your hip, your shoulder position, if you're leaning to one side and just going through a couple reps, I feel like a single leg squat just reveals a lot. It's a really good way to see how everything is moving. So I would, I would really encourage that. Lisa, I'll just share that one of my biggest fears, unlike most people, it's not public speaking. It's going through a movement assessment in front of a bunch of physical therapists and I had to do single leg squats at this workshop in front of 30 physical therapists. 
and everyone was like, ooh, yeah, that left side. You know, there's like murmurs in the crowd. And I'm sitting there like, this is literally like my biggest fear ever is just exposing all of my anatomical like weaknesses and imbalances for the world to see. <laughs> I mean, it was very funny for me, but it was yeah. also like, wow, I am so vulnerable right now. <laughs> We're good at ripping people apart before bringing them back up. <laughs> Be like, you have this wrong and this wrong. <laughs> Thank you, PPs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is funny. Um, would a camera also be helpful in this way? Because I think with, you know, just pulling out your phone and having like your partner, your a family member, whoever film you, I, I think that would also be helpful in addition to using a mirror, right? Because you might be able to get like sideways and, and mm -hmm. behind, you know, backwards shots of your movement as well. Yeah, for sure. You would want to do it at like record it at chest tight, I would say. But I think that's a great idea, like backside, front side, side view. And that's really the same. A lot of people are nervous to see what they look like, but it's the same with like assessing your running form. I mean, you can see a lot if you record yourself running from the side view, back view, front view, and just slow it down and just look at the right side compared to the left side, especially if you have something going on. I feel like just slowing everything down, putting it in half speed, it's going to really show a lot. Yeah, I kind of look at all of this as almost like a, a big fact-finding mission. We're just collecting data. We are collecting information, figuring out, okay, how do I move? Because then that's going to influence your thinking about what exercises you might have to focus on or, you know, where your imbalances or weaknesses are. And, you know, if you go to a physical therapist and, and you go in with more of this self-knowledge about yourself – are you then a better PT patient because you, you have a certain idea on what's wrong? Or is it better to sort of go in with a complete blank slate and have the PT figure things out? So it can be a mix of both. I think if, you know, if someone comes to me and they say, well, Google said this, then it's like, maybe don't bring Google into this. Maybe bring more, more video evidence into it. And that's going to, I think that's going to help or more so describe what you're feeling with certain activities. That's going to help. Um, but I don't, I mean, I feel like PTs kind of ignore if someone says Google said I have this. But I think just having, like, more video evidence is really, really helpful, especially if it's running form. Because if a PT, I keep looking to my left because I have a tread, but if a PT is looking at you running, I know for me, if I just looked at someone running at and didn't sl record them and slow them down, I, I really wouldn't be able to see that much. So it's really being able to slow someone's running form down, being able to slow someone's movements down, and then breaking them down, looking at each part, so you can build it back up. That is so interesting. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Lisa, this, is, this has been really helpful for me as I tried to better wrap my head around this topic. And I think it's a great addition to the conversation we had on Instagram. Um, I think one of the big lessons I'm taking away from this is that we have to be mindful when we're doing our strength training. And the strength training that we're doing has to cover those four categories that you mentioned, the stability, the mobility, strength, and power. And if we're being mindful and we're really making sure that we're, we're doing these exercises to the best of our ability, the way that they're supposed to be done, proper muscle recruitment patterns, I think we are going to be leaps and bounds above most runners with our injury resilience and our ability to stay healthy long term. Because I think most injuries do stem from this general area, some sort of glute slash hip problem causing issues down the chain. So uh, I, I think this has been super helpful and also very actionable. Like there's things runners can definitely take from this conversation and just plug right into their training today. Yeah, for sure. I'm hoping that it is really helpful. And also if you feel something come up, like maybe you feel a hip twinge, then you really just know to come back to that mobility and stability, work on your control, work on maybe mobility. I'm sure you're going to find something going on that you can work on. So you can take action right away versus you know, waiting for an appointments and stuff like that. So with all that said, Lisa, is there anything I might have missed in this conversation about glute pathologies, glute weakness, glute imbalances, activation, 
injuries that might stem from this, how runners can address it in their training. Is there anything that you'd like to add? The only other thing we didn't talk about that much is like a hip impingement where hip flexors and adductors are taking over and glutes just not really working like it should. But it's really coming down to the same principles that we talked about where just like hamstring or lumbar spine where if your adductors are really tight, it doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be strengthened. It could mean that they're just being overworked. Same with hip flexors. So it's kind of like that same principle where don't just chase the pain, really look at the whole picture and see what's going on. Great. That's good to know. All right, Lisa, thank you so much for your time, your expertise today. Um, what is your Instagram handle and do you have any other resources for runners that they may want to check out? Yeah. So Instagram is Dr. Period, Lisa period, DPT, DR period for doctor. Um, I'm on YouTube and then I just started a podcast rehab for runners and I believe that's pretty much it. All right. Well, we'll include links to those in the show notes so folks can check it out if they forget. Lisa, thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me.